hand it off to uh, to Rachel um, from DCVC, and thank you, Dr. Rachel Slabaugh. Um, I know that you don't put that in everything, but it's an important thing. Uh, you are an actual nuclear scientist, the first one to, that I've ever met. Thanks so much. Um, well, hello, uh, all of you in the audience. Thank you so much for joining the Nuclear Energy Climate Solutions Showcase. We've got three exciting companies demonstrating a range of solutions, and we need all of them. So for today's session, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, introduce the panelists who will each give a short presentation about their company, and that should leave us about 20 minutes for Q&A. So I learned about nuclear energy as a freshman in college and thought, you mean there's a thing the size and shape of a coal plant that doesn't emit air pollution and we're already making electricity with it? I want to do more of that. And so in the 20 years since then, um, I've worked as a nuclear reactor operator, as a senior engineer in an applied nuclear laboratory, as a tenured nuclear engineering professor at Berkeley, as a program director at ARPA-E, where I started the fission program. I ran the nuclear energy part of the Biden-Harris transition, and I founded the Nuclear Innovation Boot Camp, as well as the Good Energy Collective. Uh, so I've spent some time in the sector. Um, I chose nuclear for environmental reasons and think it has been and will be an important part of the climate fight. And now I find myself as a climate tech investor at DCBC trying to help bring amazing climate companies like these ones into the market. So we have both fission and fusion companies on the panel today. They are technologies that are often lumped together, but actually don't have that much to do with one another um, besides three main features. So one, they use reactions in the nucleus as a source of energy, which are millions of times more efficient than chemical reactions from something like burning fossil fuel. So this makes them extremely resource efficient energy sources. Two, they do or will provide reliable electricity we can control, what we call dispatchable electricity. And three, they do not produce air pollution. So these shared features make them compelling and is why they will play an essential role in our energy future. Um, and as a quick aside, so we can avoid it, I have no space for a fission versus fusion discussion or a one clean energy versus another. We need all of them and the kitchen sink if we have any chance of displacing fossil fuel and growing our electricity generation as much as we need to. Um, so one more point, now is an incredibly exciting time in both of these industries. New innovative companies are seeing unprecedented investment from the private sector. There are new government programs to help them demonstrate new technologies. Incentives for clean energy deployment have never been stronger domestically. And talented people from other innovative sectors are starting and joining nuclear companies, which I find incredibly promising and is part of why we're here today. So it is truly an exciting time to build these solutions. Um, and before I introduce our panelists, I want to disclose that I'm an independent board member for Radiant. I funded Boltex from ARPA-E and DCBC is invested in Radiant, Oklo, another fission company, and Zap, a fusion company. So that's the end of my caveats. Uh, okay, so without further ado, I would love to introduce Doug Bernauer, who is CEO of Radiant and brings 12, year, 12 years of experience from SpaceX, where he led the Grasshopper, uh, led avionics at Grasshopper, their first rocket with landing legs. He co-founded Radiant as a test-first nuclear technology company developing Kaleidos, a high-temperature gas micro-reactor, to replace diesel generators for microgrids, provide reliable backup power, and act as clean charging power for electric vehicles. Doug is married with four kids and enjoys history, economics, music, and is a self-proclaimed rule master at Game Nights. Uh, take it away, Doug. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh I don't think I need to even say anymore. You summarize it so well. You could just skip me and we'll go right on to someone else. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Doug Brenauer, as Ra Rachel did a uh, great introduction. Thank you so much. Um, Radiant is making nuclear power portable. Uh, this is a picture of the micro reactor we're developing. Uh, we are the fission flavor of nuclear that, that, that Rachel mentioned. So this is a portable nuclear micro reactor at a one megawatt scale. So it's roughly equivalent to a diesel generator. Uh, They're often used for reliable power supply uh, at military bases, hospitals. Um, it also is used for prime power in a lot of remote locations where people have no other choice for a power source that's dispatchable. 
so I want to just tell you a little bit about our company. Uh, we are a, really an engineering first or a product first sort of company. Um, we, uh, right, we are a climate friendly alternative to diesel generators and we're only working on Kaleidos, uh, the reactor that I showed on, on the previous image. Uh, and working towards a demonstration at full scale in 2026. So that is a 3.5 megawatts of heat would be generated in, inside of a dome at a national laboratory. And then from there, we would go into production a few years thereafter. Um, I started at SpaceX, I spent 12 years there. Uh, uh, Rachel already mentioned I, I worked on Grasshopper, but one of the other things I worked on was trying to take Starship to Mars and then refuel it re with resources on Mars. Uh, that's where I really learned about nuclear and fell in love with it as a solution uh, because I was trying to solve that with solar panels. Uh, we've got just some imagery here. It's very awful to try to solve it. Something like five miracles in a row is what we estimated we would need for that to actually work. Um, and I started uh, uh, thinking about nuclear only, knowing that solar wouldn't work. Uh, and I went on this journey of just reading more and more and becoming more and more curious. Uh, eventually, I left SpaceX uh, and spent about a year meeting people like Rachel and others who helped me learn very quickly about nuclear. And I, and I took on the challenges of design. Um, and, and realize that really we have to focus on Earth. We've got to solve a lot of problems here on Earth with nuclear first. And so we aren't working on anything in space right now. If you look at a, a map of power generation in the US, uh, I'd really like to show, show this slide and share it with people because uh, a lot of us are from some location on here or from a couple of locations on here. Uh, and you can really dig in and read uh, a lot with your eyes here, uh, right? We, have, we produce a lot of power from coal still right, 37% of total electric power generation. So it's a big, big reminder. Uh, this is a big, a big problem to be solved. Uh, we are a micro reactor. So we're a thousand times smaller than a grid scale nuclear reactor. You can see nuclear here is the, the pink color. And there's a couple of nuclear power plants in the West that they're really, uh, you know, as a single, at a single location, they're some of the largest clean power providers possible. It is the largest clean power <laughs> provider uh, available. Um, but we're not really addressing that, right? Because uh, our reactor can power about a thousand homes, right? It's enough clean power for about 2,500 people. Um, so really our focus is on all these little tiny dots in areas that are using uh, coal or diesel fuel. Um, and especially in very remote locations, like in Alaska, uh, all these far Northern sites that are hard to reach in the winter, inland sites that need ice roads to be reached where they have to store huge fuel tanks of diesel. Uh, those are some where, where, where our customers are in particular. So uh, what are the key aspects of Kaleidos? Uh, right, it is a one megawatt electric generator. Um, it also produces about 1.9 megawatts of heat energy. Uh, that is a recoverable up to about 80 degrees Celsius. So that's a good hot water temperature uh, to produce hot water for a building um, or a whole community um, or to heat air within a large facility. Um, and the really unique thing about this scale is that we can build an entire reactor in a factory um, using an NRC license called a manufacturing license. Uh, we can actually fuel the units and build them like we're building cars, having many units coming off of a, a production line per week. Um, and because of that, we can, we can, uh, the unit's so small, it's portable, we can ship it via truck or even move it by aircraft to get it to a customer site and have it installed in just two days. So it's not like a typical long construction period you might have with a, a much larger reactor. Uh, and instead you can locate it with minimal infrastructure on the customer site, use it to produce clean power. Um, and you could patch that grid I showed of all the, all the coal and oil powered sources, these less clean forms of energy with an ability to charge electric vehicles, uh, about 10 of them simultaneously per unit. Because there's no infrastructure, you know, if you then added some other form of clean power, some fusion reactor, uh, you know, or hydro power or solar or something, you could move these away and use that source in the future. So it's a really great way to, for minimal infrastructure, be able to immediately patch the grid uh, with clean energy. Uh, and our, uh, one of the unique aspects here also is that uh, no waste is left on site. It remains in the unit. Uh, the unit can be shut down. It has to wait for about a month at the customer site. And then after that, it can be put back on a truck and, get, and it can go back to the centralized facility where we then refuel it and, and take the waste and put it into dry cask storage. That's it, that's a good spot for me to, to stop, I think. Well, actually, one more, one more slide. So we, we're using triso fuel. This is an accident tolerant form of fuel. Uh, it really means that we've got a meltdown proof design. Uh, combined with it being a very small amount of fuel, we have a really large surface area to volume ratio because this system is so small um, and it has passive cooling because of that. 
uh, natural, so we don't need to run a coolant pump in a, a scenario where that fails, it's not dangerous to the system. Natural convection will cool the steel pressure vessel. Uh, and we use helium as a coolant. Uh, we really like this because we think there, at some point there could be a leak of, a, of coolant material. If there is with helium, it doesn't create a disaster. It, it's not a liquid, it can't drain into the ground somewhere uh, and create a problem. So that's Kaleidos uh, and Radiant. Uh, we're hiring right now. Uh, we're getting uh, ready to do a new fundraise soon in the future here. Um, we've got, we know when our pressure vessel is coming and a lot of the other parts. So we're really excited uh, to go build a prototype. The next big step is this electrically heated system uh, that's going to have about 80 kilowatts of heat inside of nuclear grade graphite in that pressure vessel. And we'll be testing it in our facility here in California. Great, thank you so much, Doug. Um, Aaron, you're up next. Aaron Polka is the Vice President Communications at Voltex. With two decades of marketing, communications, and media management experience, he has a passion for effective storytelling. Prior to joining Voltex, Aaron was Director of Communications at the Canadian Nuclear Association. And she'll speak more about this, but Voltex is developing what I will call a medium-sized molten salt reactor that uses recycled nuclear fuel in addition to a system that does the recycling. Thanks, Rachel. Can everybody see my screen, my presenting screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Um, I would categorize it more as a, a large, small reactor, <laughs> but, uh, but that's more semantics than anything. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me, Aaron Polka, Vice President of Communications at Moltex. Um, so I guess just starting at the beginning, who is Moltex? Um, uh, we were founded in 2014 in the UK. Um, and in 2018, our technology was chosen by the uh, by NB Power, which is a nuclear utility in New Brunswick, to develop our technology with the goal of operation on their uh, on their nuclear site. So we opened an office there. Uh, we um, we opened a subsidiary, Multex Energy Canada, um, focused on the. Um, on our waste burning reactor. That's one of three different variants. Uh, the waste burning reactor is the one we're really focused on, on developing in Canada. And the last few years has been uh, really about uh, growing the team, advancing our design, because it's, it's quite an innovative design, it's never been done before, um, conducting R&D, key experiments, you know, proving everything that we say the reactor can do, it can actually do, and, uh, and building stakeholder support within New Brunswick. We've received major investments from government and the private sector. We just finished the first phase of our regulatory process. It's a, a two-phase pre-licensing process. And then, um, and then that basically tells us that we have everything we need to be licensable in Canada. Um, and most recently, we formed a strategic partnership with SNC-Lavalin. So this is a, a, a rendering of what uh, a, a site might look like. First thing you see in the foreground, oh, sorry, is uh, the, the reactor itself, the stable salt reactor waste burner. That's a mouthful. So we, we shorten it to SSRW, which is still a bit of a mouthful. Um, but it's a, it's a molten salt reactor. Um, and uh, what makes this, this reactor particularly unique is that instead of using uranium as fuel, it uses recycled nuclear waste. And that process takes place in our Watts facility. So that's where we take nuclear waste, spent nuclear fuel, put it through a series of chemical processes um, to create the fuel for the SSRW. And then the, the last thing that we have here is grid reserve, which are basically thermal energy storage tanks. Uh, and that enables our reactor to store energy when it isn't needed on the grid. Say for example, when there's low demand or renewables are powering the grid and then dispatch it when, when it's needed. So in theory, we can have a 300 megawatt reactor, but it could be used to power 900 megawatts of electricity for you know, a third of the day. So the reactor itself, uh, it's a high temperature molten salt reactor. High temperature is kind of the, the, the key there because high temperature enables us to produce more than just electricity, but electricity enables us to um, produce the heat for, uh, for district heating, to produce uh, hydrogen efficiently. 
um, and uh, uh, produce the power for, for resource industries and to decarbonize transportation. So to basically, you know, try to decarbonize those other harder to abate sectors of the economy. Um, it's, a, I mean, like all nuclear reactors, it has a relatively small land footprint. Um, and uh, it, is a, it is technically a Gen 4 reactor, which, uh, which means it's the most advanced type of reactor under development. Um, and it has a lot of inherent passive safety features. So um, kind of looking at what makes us unique and, and uh, you know, if I'm, I may say so attractive to the market is the fact that we recycle nuclear waste, that we're not relying on freshly mined uranium. So if you look on the left-hand side, that's a typical fuel cycle. Uh, you mine uranium, you create fuel uh, pellets that go into bundles, that goes into a reactor and, you, and the reactor produces uh, uh, electricity. Um, and uh, when it's used up as much uh, energy as it can, those fuel bundles go into storage. And right now the plan in Canada and, and in many parts of the world is to eventually store that in a deep geological repository. And while that is a perfectly safe and sensible solution, what we're proposing is a bit of an extension of that, which is to take that spent fuel, which still has usable energy, extract it, and use it to power a new generation of reactor. Um, and in doing that, not only do you do produce more clean energy, but you uh, significantly reduce the volume of long-lived waste. So we can reduce uh, up to 99% of the volume of long-lived waste. And you know, it, in, in doing that, the, the disposal um, requirements and costs come down significantly. So uh, this is just sort of a visual illustration of how grid reserve works, which is what I was uh, talking about earlier. You know, you have a 300 megawatt reactor. Um, when it isn't needed on the grid, it charges up these, these, uh, these molten salt storage tanks. And then when it is needed on the grid, you have the 300 megawatts coming from the reactor, but also up to 600 more megawatts uh, uh, feeding into the grid. Um, here again is just to illustrate the point that you know we we are we produce electricity, but that electricity can be used for for more than just um, more than just powering the grid. It can be used for hydrogen production, which is you know a big hot topic these days. Clean fuels, district heating, uh, etc. And of course, uh, you know the question always it always kind of comes down to well, you know. Uh, the, the, you know, people want to reduce the volume of waste, obviously, but how much how much waste is there really available? Because uh, you know, it's 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 a bit finite. Um, well, in Canada, where we're developing the first of a kind, we there's enough waste from the Candu fleet by the time they reach the end of their lives to power uh, to, to produce eight gigawatts of SSRW power from SSRWs. Or, you know, if you're looking at 500 megawatt units, which is what we anticipate the next units to be in terms of size, you're looking at about 16 units. In the US, that number jumps to 40 units. And globally, and bear in mind, this is excluding regions that are politically or financially unfavorable. But even, even then, there's a market for about 240 uh, SSRWs. The benefits, of course, um, you know, a lot of these goes without saying, but I'll say them anyway, cleaner air, uh, fewer health related issues as a result of air pollution and the burning of fossil fuels, um, uh, positive impact on climate change, uh, the, 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 the reactor and most nuclear reactors, but uh, ours in particular is very land and water efficient. Um, and, uh, and, 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 um, and uh, you know, it's 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 we're reducing the volume of long-lived waste. Uh, Socio-economically speaking, we're creating jobs, uh, not just at the plant, which is what a lot of people sort of intuitively think, but the majority of the jobs are actually within the supply chain. So, uh, providing the the parts and services that we're going to need to 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 run the reactor, um, education, training, improved standards of living, and and. You know, there's not to mention wealth in areas that do actually uh, build and implement these reactors. Um, so how many jobs are we talking about? I mean, that's kind of the, 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 the topic today. So uh, we, we, we've done some preliminary studies. Uh, they show that a successful international deployment 
of uh, Moltex and ARC reactors. So ARC is the other company that's developing a reactor in New Brunswick. A successful international rollout between 2030 and 2060 would create a thousand person years of employment just in New Brunswick um, and about a half a million Canada wide. Um, and you got to remember also, there, it's a nuclear reactor, right? So it's being built to last 60, 80 years. So these jobs will, will go well beyond that 2060 timeframe. Uh, and finally, just uh, looking at the kinds of jobs that'll become available. Um, it's, 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 uh, again, it's more than what you might sort of uh, automatically think engineers and scientists uh, of all sorts. Uh, I mean, the top ones would probably be nuclear, mechanical and chemical, um, but, uh, but it, it does run, run the gamut, skilled trades and technicians. Um, and then, you know, jobs that you don't typically think of, like communications, you know, and I, I studied communications, I didn't think I'd end up in the nuclear industry, but here I am, we need those types of people, right? Um, human resources, lawyers, IT, uh, all, the, all the sort of typical jobs that you need to, to, to keep a business running. Um, and we are also hiring. <laughs> Um, so uh, that's all I had for today. Um, I'll end it there and, and hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, and next up we have Richard McGee, who is the Senior Director of Physics R&D at TAU Technologies, overseeing research efforts to enable a neutronic fusion in self-organized plasma. And I'm guessing he will explain what a neutronic fusion is. Um, he believes fusion is a critical component of the energy portfolio required for sustainable development. He also believes the old cliche, fusion is the energy source of the future and always will be, and that future arrived on December 5th, 2022. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab achieved a set of fusion reactions that produced more energy than it took to cause the reactions uh, world first uh, in December. So Rich, take it away. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, is my audio and slide look okay? Yep. All right, uh, very good. <clears throat> uh, to begin here, um, I don't think I need to motivate the need for carbon-free energy to this audience, so I'll just move very quickly. Obviously, <clears throat> the global demand for electric power is increasing, even as the global population remains uh, steady at around 8 billion just due to the increasing demand in the developing world. Currently, rely, we rely on, on fossil fuels to meet that demand, and uh, that is not a sustainable strategy. So we need, we need carbon-free energy. And one way to do that, and the way that we are trying to do it here at TAE, is with fusion. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with fusion, especially with the recent news out of NIFS and um, JET the previous year. Fusion, generally speaking, is, is a nuclear reaction that powers the stars and, and our sun. So all of the energy here on Earth that we use ultimately comes from the sun. Um, as far as the nuclear reaction goes, what we're talking about is the fusing of two light atoms, usually isotopes of hydrogen or in the case of TAE's approach, hydrogen and boron. This nuclear reaction often produces neutrons, uh, which are actually the particle that is captured to extract that energy, that nuclear energy and convert it into electricity. Um, a neutronic fusion refers to a, a fusion reaction which does not produce neutrons. So hydrogen and boron produces three helium atoms, which for historical reasons were called alpha particles. And that's actually how TAE got its name. TAE stands for Tri-Alpha Energy, Tri-Alpha, the three alpha products of the proton-boron fusion reaction. So in order to make this nuclear reaction happen, you need a tremendous amount of pressure, that is temperature and density, and you need to, to confine it in, in some manner. In the case of NIF, the, the uh, National Ignition Facility that was in the news recently, they use um, inertia to confine the plasma. We here at TA use magnetic fields. That's kind of the, the microscopic uh, picture as an energy source. What we're really talking about here today, the, the three key points are that this is carbon-free, 
The fuel itself is abundant and cheap. Hydrogen, hydrogen of course, can be harvested from seawater and boron is abundant in the surface of the earth. And there is um, no long lived radioactive waste. Uh, Rachel mentioned this at the top of the meeting, but it is a really exciting time in fusion energy. And I, I'd like to talk about that just for a minute here. Uh, this is a plot taken from a, a document written in 1976. And it shows the projection of uh, fusion funding over the course of time for five different funding scenarios, along with the point at which they expected to reach demonstration. That is the first fusion reaction that would produce net energy. Um, these are 1976 dollars, so a few hundred million dollars. They thought if it was funded at the upper end of that range, um, might have fusion by 1990. Uh, if it was in the lower hundreds of millions of dollars, it might take till 2005. Um, as you know, what actually happened was the funding was not even commensurate with this logic two level, somewhere probably between logic one and logic two, and this date got pushed out even further. What was not expected in 1976 was something really incredible that happened in the last few years, and that is that the private funding for fusion energy research exploded. Um, so in 2021, you can see the green bar there that represents the amount of money funding private fusion efforts is now um, triple or more the amount of funding in the government program. And um, that influx of private capital is commensurate with this explosion of um, private fusion companies, of which um, TAE is one. And I'd like to tell you a little more, bit more about us. We are actually the oldest private fusion company. We were founded in 1998. So uh, are celebrating our 25th birthday in April, actually. Uh, spun out from the physics department at the University of California, Irvine and currently have over 400 employees globally in the US, um, the EU and the UK. And uh, seen in the pictures here are our fourth generation national lab scale fusion devices, device, actually our sixth generation device overall. I can tell you um, a little bit about that in the next uh, slide or two. I mentioned that we also have an expansive uh, patent portfolio, not only in fusion, but in some spin-off technologies. Um, we were originally called TAE, uh, excuse me, Tri-Alpha Energy. We're now TAE Technologies to reflect the fact that we have these um, spin-off companies. And if you're interested in the, the technical stuff, um, all of our research is posted online. We do have a, a unique approach to fusion. As I mentioned earlier, it's a neutronic, so we're pursuing fusion with hydrogen boron fuel. It's also um, a little bit of a difference confinement scheme. If you are familiar with fusion, you're probably familiar with the tokamak, with ITER, the device that's being built in Southern France. Those are all toroidal in shape, donut shaped. Our device is linear, um, lots of engineering advantages with that. It's a little bit of a different um, type of plasma uh, that relies on currents inside the plasma itself rather than currents um, imposed with external coils. And um, I believe I mentioned those other two points. Um, so so an, another distinguishing feature of TAE, besides the fact that we're pursuing this alternative fuel cycle and this alternative confinements concept is that we are actively um, spinning off technologies that we have developed on our way to our fusion reactor. Uh, one is in cancer treatment. So we have beams that we use to heat the plasma that turn out to be great for beams in radiation oncology. And that uh, effort has resulted in a, in a spinning out TAE life sciences. And we very recently, actually, I think the press release was yesterday, um, spun off another subsidiary, subsidiary excuse me, called uh, Power Solutions, which is developing energy solutions for uh, electrical energy storage and electric mobility, electric cars. I'll finish with a plug. Uh, we too are hiring and realizing commercial fusion energy takes more than physicists. Although we are hiring physicists, I understand that the audience today comes mostly from the, the data science and the tech field. 
We need computational scientists, data scientists and engineers, web developers, um, hardware engineers, and many more. So please uh, check out tae.com slash careers, fusion opportunities. There's also the opportunity to explore the uh, spinoffs. Or if you're interested in the company but don't know where you might fit in, please uh, email me at this email address. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Great presentations. And we have, as promised, 20 minutes or so for discussion. So thanks all for sticking to time. We have a lot of questions in the chat. Some have been um, answered, so we'll keep working on that. But the one that has come up in, in a bunch of different versions and is also appropriate to the session is really um, joining the nuclear space. So I'd like to hear a little bit about from each of you, what do you think are important um, skills in approaching this problem space and what are the types of people? I know we have a lot of software engineers in the audience, so that's one slice of it, but just who should join nuclear? What are the skill sets? Maybe some of what is the path or, or process um, to figure out how you might fit. I could speak to Radiant. So we're, we're a startup. So we're often looking for people who have a very multidisciplinary approach, um, often looking for candidates that have done a lot of project work, um, such as Formula One in school or robotics teams, uh, things where we, we look for candidates that have had a lot of hands on because they tend to, you know, have people who've built mechanical components, but have to work with electrical engineers building a control system who then have to work with a software engineers. And, uh, and I think those are some of the some of the best candidates. Uh, we're looking for ways to bring nuclear more into the fold there. I think it would be quite interesting in the future to be able to do something at universities, some project work with nuclear. That's something uh, Rachel and I want to talk about further, but uh, I think it's a very cool idea. But uh, generally, uh, you know, we need nuclear engineers, software engineers, mechanical, materials, electrical, there's all sorts, and also non-engineering folks. Um, so even as a startup, we have about one-sixth or one-fifth of our staff now are, are not engineers helping build out business development, customer engagement, financial models, uh, all sorts of these things. Um, so really looking for people who are super passionate about nuclear, uh, that are aligned with the mission. And as a, as a startup, we need people who can do three or four or five jobs and help us figure out when that another person comes in uh, and helps and where they would help. Great, Aaron and Rich. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Doug really kind of nailed nailed the answer on that one. Uh, engineering is definitely the the biggest tranche right now. Um, that's the area. That's the department that's growing the fastest. But you know, uh, like I always, I, I I like to sort of stand up for the non non technical non engineers um, within the industry and say, you know, you can, you can, it, it's not like the movie, you know, if you build it, they will come like it's, it doesn't really work that way, you know, so we need, we need to build it, but we also need to promote it and sell it. Um, and, uh, and, and all those other, you know, important business aspects on, on the back end. So it's, uh, and for that really, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely to have a background in nuclear, but it's certainly not necessary. Um, you know, I, I look at myself and I, I joined the industry sort of halfway through my career. Um, and uh, it, it is a, a large learning curve, but it's, it's not to say, you know, that, uh, that people shouldn't consider making that switch. It's, it's been a, it's been, it's a great industry um, to work in and, and it's exciting. And, and um, you know, I, I'm sort of like you, Rachel, you know, I, I joined it because, um, uh, because I do believe in, in, in its potential to help solve climate change. And, and so, uh, you know, I think if, if you're out there and you're passionate about it, then then it's something to, to definitely consider. Um, yeah, I'll um, make a point here that there is a distinction between fusion and fission and in, in that fusion is still very much an R&D effort. So while um, in, in the fusion space, uh, the, the technology is to the point of actually deploying reactors, um, we are still very much in, in the R&D phase. So our current device, um, C2W, is, is a physics experiment, and it, it, it doesn't produce energy. It produces data, and it produces loads of data. And we have a, a whole group uh, doing computer simulations on national laboratory supercomputers generating loads of data. 
So we need data scientists and data engineers to, to help with that lift. Um, and then, um, you know, deployment is the next phase. Copernicus, the, the next generation device of so Gen 7, I, I showed you a picture of, of C2W, the device that comes next, will actually be a demonstration reactor um, that is, uh, excuse me, not a reactor, but a, a demonstration experiment to, to demonstrate that it can produce uh, net energy and reach this, this performance point. And the device after that is our, our um, pilot plant. So we're at a different stage of development than fusion. And for that reason, um, have a little bit of a different uh, need as far as um, skill set. Yeah, great point. And maybe to follow up, there have been some other questions of, um, for all of you, location, do employees need to relocate to where you are and also say where your company headquarters are? Um, or are there options for remote work? And um, maybe, the, you know, the other one is some people's sort of degree title might not be a thing that is typically in a job posting, but could still be a good fit, like environmental engineering or something where it's not as commonly talked about. So how would you think about something like that? Um, I'll, I'll jump in to that one, uh, just because our, our off, well, for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, um, our office is located in St. John, New Brunswick, which is, is not the bustling metropolis that you might think it is. Um, and it's hard to attract uh, uh, it's hard to attract workers and for a lot of the work it it does benefit from being in the office and working as part of a team um, and so that's that's definitely an area we we struggle in um, and I think it's uh, I think we're we're likely to to open an office in, in a more um, central location like Toronto or something like that because um, it, I, you know, speaking very honestly, I think we miss out sometimes on, on really good candidates because, um, because they're not able to, for one way, reason or another, to, to relocate. That said, um, there are certainly some jobs that can be done remotely. Um, I, I joke sometimes that I'm in the Multex Ottawa office, but it's really my spare bedroom. Um, so, and, and I, I never feel uh, that uh, that you know the, that my department is is suffering or lacking because I'm not in the office on a day to day uh, basis. So, um, I guess the the short version of that is that for some jobs you do have to be uh, you know, in, in, in office collaborating and, and, and working as part of a team. And sometimes it's very much possible to, 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 to work virtually and COVID has taught us that uh, if nothing else. Yeah, ab absolutely. Same for TAE, we're very much hybrid since COVID. We're lo located in Orange County, California. So those jobs that require working on the machine and turning a wrench, et cetera, um, those, those employees need to be be to relocate, be on site, but we have plenty of other jobs um, that are hybrid or fully remote. So that's uh, definitely an option. Uh, great, Radiant's a little bit different. We, we only have 24 employees, so we're quite small uh, and a lot of people wearing five hats. And at least one of those often is one of those roles that you can only do in person. So we're primarily in person. Um, it's also something I really believe in because I think it's more fun to work in person and work together just creates more camaraderie. Uh, a lot of the things that I did at SpaceX were only really possible because we worked in person and together on them. Um, and after I got my feet wet on the Grasshopper project where we made a rocket in just, just a year, the first one with legs, uh, that team was very close knit and I, uh, I enforced that we had to go be on the hardware. So we got out of our regular desks and we built desks around where we were building the equipment. Uh, it was one of the most awesome experiences and that that caught on in a lot of areas within SpaceX. So uh, I, I, just, I think it's excellent to, to do that in-person work. But of course, uh, I'll say also we have advisors that are remote. And these are often people with many years of experience in key areas. And we just we need their help immediately because time is of the essence. So it depends. <laughs> it's the best answer. And where Maybe that gives a flavor of it. Uh, in El Segundo, California. Which is by LA. For those yep. of you who West near the airport. Yep. West Coast. Um, and so there have been a few questions about this. And so I'm going to start with this and then we'll end on the controversial one so that if we run out of time, there are plenty of resources out there in the world for you to go look up the controversial questions. And I can send some of the ones I think are best to Jonathan. But 
Let's talk a little bit about the economic propositions of your reactors. So what are, what's the ROI on some of these devices? What are the, why, you know, we hear a lot about nuclear is slow and expensive. So what, what's the, why are investors dumping money into these sectors? What's, what's the promise? So for Radiant, I think the, the really interesting financial angle here is the economies of scale due to mass production because of the very small size of the unit. Um, and the other side of the coin being that the markets are out there uh, because we use so many diesel generators today uh, and there are climate initiatives uh, in place, um, especially with a lot of federally supported organizations as well, uh, and a lot of remote communities that use diesel. Uh, and, and also uh, remote natural resources that are important, like mines, you know, things that are in a place where you can't choose where that that is and where they they truck up diesel fuel to it endlessly, uh, which which makes it very expensive. So the because of the, the market niche that we've got is a it makes the economics very, very promising for, for specifically a micro reactor. Um, so for Multex, I mean, the, Multex was founded because we believed that nuclear power was getting too expensive and we could do it more cost effectively. Um, you know, when you look at these conventional reactors, uh, they were actually quite cheap in the in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, but then there were a series of accidents and, and industries realized like, you know, we need to we need to make these reactors safer. So they implemented a lot of engineering safety features um, and it worked. They, they made them safer, but it also made them more expensive. Um, and so, you know, what we're trying to do with our reactor is to include a lot of pa passive safety elements and inherent safety features um, so that we don't need that in that expensive engineering safety. Um, and uh, so we're able to build uh, these units more, more, more affordably. Um, and uh, so far, I mean, our cost projections show that we are we, we are indeed going to be a cost effective option. Um, similar to similar to gas, similar to solar, similar to wind, um, and uh, so uh, you know it's it's not your know, your your parents' nuclear, I guess you could say. Yeah, likewise for fusion, I, I don't have the um, LCOE numbers in in front of me here, but we we believe that once the technology is developed, um, it will be economically competitive with established. Uh, energy, electrical energy generation methods. Um, and of course there's um, no fuel costs, uh, no waste disposal costs, and the machine itself is, is relatively cheap, especially our, our concept doesn't require superconducting magnets, for example, which is a big cost driver in, in tokamak concepts. Um, so, yes. Yeah, and I, I know this is, different for all of you because you're at a bit different stages, but you're all thinking about it. Um, even though you're all pre sort of sales, do you have biz ops people? How are you thinking about community engagement? Um, that kind of sort of customer and, and community focus. Uh, I'll go ahead. <laughs> so, um, so I mean that's that's two questions. I, one is is that I mean we have a committed customer, MB Power, the the utility in, in New Brunswick is going to be our first customer. Um, but you know we're we'd be foolish to rest on our laurels. So we are speaking to utilities in Ontario. Um, we're speaking uh, to a lot of folks in the states um, and uh, and select folks internationally. Um, with regards to community engagement, that's that's really more specific. Uh, in New Brunswick, there's there's uh, there's a, a decent sized indigenous uh, population, um, so a lot of our uh, engagement efforts is focused on relationship building with the First Nations. Um, but also, you know, we we try to get out there into the into the public, specifically as, as close to the reactor as possible. It will, um, we show up at uh, community events, at career fairs, at uh, uh, you know uh, chamber meetings, at business groups, uh, and uh, you know we're lucky in a way. It's lucky that it's sort of a small province. It's only it's less than a million people, so it's not unreasonable to go and try to engage with a, a, a large percentage of them and, and try to gain. Um, general support. Yeah, that, that's something I think um, 
fusion and, and next generation fission have in common is that this we're, we're trying to develop a technology that does not have the um, you know NIMBY problem. Historically, power plants were put in in places um, that were economically disadvantaged, and the power was was transported elsewhere. So, uh, we're hoping with this low environmental uh, footprint that we can actually um, integrate these these power plants into communities and, and gain social acceptance. So that's something we're working on now, as well as developing the business model so that um, when, when our reactor concept does come uh, to full fruition in the next uh, early 2030s, um, we'll be able to, to deploy. Yeah, we, uh, Ray doesn't have a, a site, but we are looking at a whole lot of options in places and uh, traveling. Uh, been to a coal mine in Alaska recently, uh, underground in a, a gold mining site in Idaho, uh, talking to the real end users. Uh, we're a, a really small market, so it, it's somewhat an easier job in that right? it's power for essentially one company or one facility rather than a whole town or area. Um, but we're work, we work through our investors, through NGOs, through federal agencies that have uh, communications arms that can help with these sort of things. We do have the Department of Energy who focuses quite a lot on this area, uh, especially through uh, their, their fuel and waste management teams. Um, and they've got strategies and relationships often longstanding uh, with a lot of locations that already are nuclear sites. So there are some uh, advantageous locations to think about citing a new nuclear project. Great, thanks. And now there have been several questions about this. What are What is the regulatory environment like? And maybe as a, as a preface to that, because um, not everyone in the audience is probably familiar. There are what are called large light water reactors right now that have been producing electricity for decades. The advanced reactor designs that we're talking about here in, in fission um, have different fuels and coolants. For many of them, we have operated sort of at scale versions of them in the past, um, but it's been a while and, and these are really are new designs that have to go through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a licensing process. And um, I'll, I'll let Rich also talk to the, the fusion uh, aspect of regulation because it's a little bit of a different story, but let's start with fission. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, there are four ways to license a reactor. Uh, it's not just the NRC uh, to license a system. Um, we are intending to use DOE authorization licensing to test uh, our demonstration unit in 2026. Uh, so this is a path that you can use at a national laboratory site. Uh, using their trained staff and facilities. Um, in particular, we're, we're going inside of a dome that is a secondary containment. So it means any testing that you do there is just even, even safer. Uh, so we see it as the ultimate, right, best, most responsible path to go get real test data from a system. Uh, so we're pursuing that. Uh, although, uh, as Rachel mentioned, uh, light water reactors are, all the rules are written for them. Uh, but the, for micro reactors, the NRC has been thinking about them for a while. Uh, they are somewhat prepared. They have released uh, a document in particular. Uh, I'll try to share a link uh, if I can. If some if someone is interested, you, you can just email me and I can share with, it with you. But there's a draft white paper that they they put out about a year and a half ago, talking about what they know will need to change, what they expect to be changing for micro reactors in particular. Uh, so in Canada, uh, it's a little bit different. We have the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and they regulate everything to do with nuclear. I mean, you want a nuclear gauge, you're, you're, you're going to the CNSC. Um, they are certainly set up better to regulate the large reactors. I mean, they've been around, you know, since the 1950s or, you know, uh, yeah. No, well, anyway, they've been around a while. Uh, and so it's it's certainly, uh, you know, it's it's a well-oiled machine. Um, the, the new reactors are, are really forcing change within the regulatory system. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, it's, it's like all things in the nuclear industry, it's, it's the changes is slow. Um, we are seeing progress, but we definitely, industry definitely believes there's, there's room to, um, uh, you know, expedite certain processes and, and uh, make things a little more efficient on the regulatory uh, side, because right now the licensing process is quite long and quite onerous. Um, uh, so for, for new vendors, uh, there's, like I uh, alluded to earlier, there's a, there's a pre-licensing um, process. It's voluntary, but 
voluntary, but everybody does it because you know you don't want to get you don't want to get to the point of licensing a reactor and then realize it's not licensable. So we go through this pre-licensing process. It's a two-phase process, um, and then once you've completed that, then you have to move on to to licensing. And there's there's different licenses. There's licenses for for the site, licenses to to begin construction, licenses to to begin commercial operation. Um, so it's it, it's a whole process, <laughs> and, and it does take it does take a long time. Uh, regarding fusion, this is very much an ongoing conversation, um, even amongst the, the different flavors of fusion. I think there's a, a pretty sound technical argument that um, an a neutronic fuel, a reactor burning an a neutronic fuel should be subject to different uh, regulations than a deuterium tritium uh, tokamak, for example. Um, but this this is still in the in the early stages of discussion, at least here in the United States. It's not clear yet how it's going to shake out and and um, who's going to regulate regulate us and how. I'd like to just okay. chime chime in again, and uh, I just I just want to agree strongly with that. You know, uh, we have regulations that were written a very long time ago for one particular system. Uh, you can't really effectively regulate and have innovation at the same time. Innovation is going to do something new, um, and, the, and the rules won't be written for that new thing. And so uh, as a company, we are, we are trying to do deep, under, do deep studies on the physics behind our systems and the safety, looking at the safety cases that we have and the basis. And we're trying to bring new information and highlight it to the NRC and help them prepare for how the rules might need to change to successfully uh, protect the public. That's really the job of the regulator. And I think uh, any innovator has got to understand the current set of rules, but also be working on educating their regulator um, and understanding that the rules will need to change fundamentally because of the innovation. Thank you. So we have heard from three pretty different technologies, different markets, different stages of development, all doing really exciting and cutting edge and meaningful things. We have two minutes left. Um, I'm going to go Rich, Aaron, Doug, to just add any last comment or, or thought. And thank you so much for your, your time today. So, Rich. Um, sure. Thank you. I, I guess closing thought um, is that uh, a career in, in alternative uh, fission or fusion is extremely uh, rewarding, and it's an extremely exciting time to be in the field. Um, we're here at TAE are, are growing fast and looking for all different kinds of people. So if anything you heard here today sounds interesting or exciting, um, please check out the website. If, if there are not roles there that exactly fit your resume and your talents and interests, please email me. Um, we're always, always looking for, for motivated people who, who want to help save the world. So come join us. I'll just build on that um, and say, you know, absolutely agree. Check out our website uh, and uh, and don't be. I guess uh, I was I was typing a, an answer to one of the questions, which is, uh, you know, the 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 Cole's notes of it was, don't be afraid of a of a mid career um, job change. You know, if if, uh, if if nuclear is is interesting and attractive and and is sort of pulling you. Um, you know, I guess it's, it's, this is just one person's perspective, but uh, you know, I made the switch and I'm glad I did. I agree, agree with Aaron and Rich. Uh, the time is now, as Rich showed, the funding levels are really through the roof. So uh, companies like ours are all looking for great talent now because we have the, we have the money, we have the public interest, uh, we, we are gaining access to sites. We'll be able to deploy these units, but we need the teams to build them all out, run all the safety analysis, get all of the work done so that we can go and deliver uh, this great benefit to the public. Okay, thank you so much for a great panel. Jonathan, thanks for having us. Good luck with the rest of your sessions. And I think we ended on time. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks for Jonathan. joining thanks, us.